Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had an opportunity uh, to have uh, Director Les Bauer here with us. He is the director of the White Creek Wellness Center, uh, which is located in uh, Deer Lodge, Tennessee. Um, and um, ultimately, uh, for uh, Director Bauer, he has uh, spent about 39 years uh, talking about uh, health, each other's about health, and ultimately focusing on helping people live long, healthy lives. And uh, he will be talking today about cardiovascular disease. Uh, before I let him begin, just again to make some announcements uh, for administrative things, uh, everyone can should receive a card. Uh, if there's any questions that you may have or anything that you're interested in, uh, or if you'd like to have a private discussion with any of the uh, lecturers that are here with us, uh, please uh, write down your questions there. Uh, you can leave them in the Dropbox on the side and have some information that we can contact you and we'll get back to you. Uh, if we don't get uh, any questions you may have as well, please leave them out there and we'll make sure that they get answered uh, as part of the series of lectures that are happening over the weekend. Okay, so with that, I will pass it over uh, to the director. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here in uh, Canada. Um, I've been here a few times, and each time was a, was a great experience. And I want to talk to you tonight about heart disease. And as was mentioned, it, it is the number one killer in the world. But you know something that surprised me when I was doing some research or presentation here, is that cancer has suppressed heart disease. As, a, as the number one factor of death in Canada. It is projected in the United States that it will, and by 2020, to overtake heart disease. But uh, Canada is a little ahead of the United States. Uh, not in a good way um, in this area. So we need to really uh, think about what we want. What do we want out of, out of life is, is uh, greater happiness and greater health. And they pretty much are, are linked together. It's hard to be happy if you're not healthy. And it's hard to be healthy if you're not happy. We want strength to do uh, to endure stress. Now, we're getting a lot of information that's saying that stress is bad for you. But Really, stress is not bad for you. If you can handle the stress, it is strengthening. You take, uh, and a good example of stress would be exercise. You stress the muscles, you stress the bones. If you have the, the health to uh, endure that stress, the bones get stronger and the muscles get stronger. So it's not necessarily that stress is bad for you, but if you are physically enabled, if you're already stressed internally, stress will do a terrible damage to you. We want to be able to handle the stress. We want energy for the day. We want to be able to wake up in the morning and be ready to go. We don't want to have to drag ourselves over to the coffee pot or, or to something else to try to get the energy to go for the day. So we want energy for the day. We want tranquility of life, we want our life to be uh, pleasant, and we want joy. Now, joy is interesting. It's, there's a lot of laughter in the world. There's a lot of comedians and laughter, but that's not, that's not joy. Joy comes from deep within. Uh, the Bible has a verse that says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Now, that's the joy we're looking for. There are eight laws that affect our health. These laws are what we call immutable. And what we mean by immutable is means that they are unchangeable. So it doesn't matter uh, the particular situation you're in. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. It doesn't matter if you're a, a male or female or heavy or thin or whatever your condition, your skin color, not, nothing affects the fact that these laws govern our health. So if you're having a problem with your health, these are something you can examine very carefully. These are lifestyle, okay? You can examine, so are you getting enough exercise? Are you drinking enough water? Do you have a good diet? Are you getting plenty of sunshine? 
You know, the, the world's telling us the sun's bad for us. <laughs> the sun's not bad for us. The sun is unbelievably good for you. So these, you have to consider these things, these immutable laws. These are what govern your health. These will help you stay well. They'll prevent disease, and they are also the cure for disease. I was uh, on my way to Romania, and I, uh, I uh, had a little time in the airport before I could get on the plane. And I went over to the newsstand, and I saw this, um, this magazine on the newsstand from Newsweek. Now, I'm a little bit of a cheapskate, so um, normally I wouldn't pay $7 for a magazine I know I could get for 79 cents in my mailbox uh, every week, you know. But I saw this and said the one word that would, can save your life, and I went ahead and sent them $7 to find out what that word was. What do you think that word was? What? Anybody? No. So the one word that can save your life is just say no. Get a second opinion. Get a third opinion. And medicine wants to do a lot of things on you right away. They want this test and that test. And of course, it's a little different here than it is in the United States. But they'll, they'll do as many as they can uh, on you as quick as they possibly can. Because uh, it, uh, it's very profitable in the United States. And uh, many of those uh, um, examinations, procedures are very harmful to you. And it would be better if you didn't do them at all. So I, I thought that was very interesting. And then when I got home, uh, I got this from the uh, AARP in my, uh, since I'm of that age, they uh, target me. Uh, to the, the worst place to be when you're sick. The hospital. <laughs> I thought that's the place you're supposed to go when you're sick. But no, it's the worst place to be when you're sick. Uh, you, you need to take care of your health. You need to be in charge of your life. So here are the afflictions, that, uh, deadly afflictions for uh, Canada as of 2016. You can see kidney failure, cirrhosis of the liver, suicide, pneumonia, flu, Alzheimer's, diabetes, chronic lung disease, accident, heart and blood vessel disease, and cancer. So today, uh, we are going to look at heart and blood vessel disease. Now there, um, that's 267,213 people a year die here in Canada. Now you have a pop a population, I believe, about 36 million 600 people. So that's a good portion of people. In fact, uh, too much. Now, science has kind of centered on uh, looking inside the cell. So they believe that the cell is controlled from the inside out. So what's on the inside of the cell? That would be the nucleus. Okay, what's on the inside of the nucleus? The DNA. So, so we pretty much lock in on the fact that we think that uh, our whole lives are predestined, pre-controlled by whatever's in the DNA. And uh, uh, Dr. Gehrman has mentioned that uh, that uh, we can we don't have to be subject to our DNA. We can we can take control. And we'll see that. Now, Pastor Lewis Pastor said that I said that it was wrong. What did Lewis Pastor um, uh, discover? The germ, right? The germ. So, and, and, and at this point, we started thinking the germ was the whole problem. Well, you came to realize it's not a germ, it's the landscape in which that germ can flourish. So, again, in our previous presentations, we saw that, you know, what what you're putting in your intestinal tract, what you're putting in your mouth, and ending in your intestinal tract has a big factor on these things, on the cholesterol and many other things. So uh, it's very interesting that uh, Dr. Lipton has proven that the cells control from the outside in. 
So what Dr. Lipton uh, was able to do was denucleation. That means he's taking the nucleus out of the cell, uh, these are stem cells, and then uh, noticing that these cells continue to live their normal length of time, two to three months. No shorter length in, in lifespan, but also was able to take these cells because the stem cell is kind of a, a master cell. Um, and if it goes into a bone, it becomes a bone cell, a heart, heart cell, or whatever. So they're able to place these cells around and they continue to function normally. So the cell itself is not controlled by the genes. The genes are there for division. So when that cell divides, uh, the genes are necessary to, uh, to uh, make a healthy new cell, a copy of the original cell. But for daily function, not so. So heart disease has become the number one killer in the world. Uh, my statistics are actually a little behind, um, where it says 25% of the deaths in the world. Now, uh, a few years ago, there were 52 million people died in the world this year. So that's one million a week. So one quarter of those are dying from heart disease. Now, why in Brazil would heart disease be number one to kill? I flew into Brazil. This was the first thing I saw when I went in there. McDonald's. I flew into Romania. One of the first things I saw, Burger King, along with some porkers and bunnies and some other things. But you know, and, and this uh, Western lifestyle is spreading around the world, and we are taking disease with us. So um, it's actually, from what I understand, it's about 39 percent of the world's deaths now. Was 25? It's now 39. Okay, let's see if this is... So minor technical difficulty. This this uh, clip, if we get it to play, is going to tell us of the change that has happened in the lifestyle in the United States. But really, it's North America. And uh, have things changed? Our consumption of, of uh, many things has changed. Of course, it's with uh, our uh, industrial changes, our new lifestyles. I got many clips, so he needs to get this. Okay. Hopefully. No? All right, so from basically from 1950 till now, our consumption of sugar has more than double. Our consumption of meat has more than double. Our consumption of dairy has exceedingly, um, almost uh, two-thirds uh, more than what we used to. So, as there, there is always a correlation between um, the rise in anything and a cause. There has to be a cause. So the, uh, no? Okay, so we'll go on. I have some work life um, with some clips in them. So, concrete is number one killer. So, it's the number two uh, cause of death in Canada. It strikes every seven minutes. That's uh, 178 deaths every day. That's, uh, that's like uh, one plane crash a day. 
You would think that if a plane crashed every day in Canada, would you hear about it? Oh, every news outlet, uh, there would be tremendous investigations, you know, if it's the motor, if it's weather, you know, whatever. if it's happening every day, they're going to shut the airline down, and whatever airline it is. But uh, we come to accept disease as a way of life. So we don't hear about it, but there should be. We should be hearing much about heart disease. We should be hearing much about cancer. What can we do to prevent it? How can we be involved? So, if uh, your risk of, uh, of death from a heart attack is 45% if you're an average Canadian, average weight, average height, average age, so on and so forth, average diet. Uh, so risk of death from a heart attack for a vegetarian now drops to 15%. And risk from death uh, from heart attack by a vegan is 4%. Now, what is this? What is the difference between these? So, you have the first one. If you're an average individual, normally you eat meat, dairy, average amount of sugar, and so on and so forth. But then, if you become a vegetarian, it used to when I first got involved in health in the '70s, we call them lacto-ovo vegetarians. And so, lacto-ovo means eggs and, and milk and cheese. So. Uh, but no meat. But a vegan doesn't use any of the animal products. So what is that? What what is the difference? What would be the uh, the uh, effect? And that's cholesterol. So just one egg a day. One egg has 213 milligrams of cholesterol in it. So one one egg a day is going to raise your cholesterol uh, average 12 points. So chance of dying from uh, a heart attack uh, with your cholesterol, uh, 210 milligrams or greater is uh, 50%. Cholesterol is a very important thing to know. I don't know if you've had your blood tested lately. Do you know what your cholesterol content? And I'm not even sure in Canada if you go by these numbers. So it's going to be confusing. Uh, amount of cholesterol on all Grains, nuts, beans, fruits, and vegetables is zero. Many, many years ago, you know, I, I was interested in people advertising, but I went in a store, and uh, a Kroger store, I think it was, in our area, and I went to the bananas, and they had a big sign over top that said zero cholesterol. So there is no cholesterol in bananas. So it all comes from meat. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn has a very interesting little information here, and I guess we're not going to be able to get his way either, okay? So, uh, Dr. Esselstyn uh, talked about uh, some statistical information that took place, uh, I believe it was in Norway, and um, it looked at the death rate in Norway from heart disease, uh, and up till um, the, when Hitler came in and took Norway. So the, the rise in heart disease came right up until Hitler came in. And when Hitler came in, he took all of the, all of the meat, all the pork, all the beef, took all the chickens, took it all for his army, and they basically ended up having to live on a plant-based diet. And from um, that point, when Hitler came in, within a year, uh, heart disease dropped to nearly nothing. And then after the cessation of the war, meat came back in, dairy came back in, and heart disease came right back up. So it's very interesting clips. Uh, if you can, if you want to look it up when you get home, Dr. Esselton. And Dr. Esselton is, in, is uh, uh, he is specialized in heart disease. Uh, President Bill Clinton, former president of the United States, uh, had a quadruple bypass surgery, and after that surgery, then he went to Dr. Esselton, and he put him on a particular program. Um, 
which is a vegan program with some other special things. So here are four things that uh, will uh, raise your uh, possibility of having a heart attack. Uh, we call them the apocalyptic horsemen of heart disease. And they are high cholesterol, whoops, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, and diabetes. These all raise your risk of a heart attack. And if you have them all, it's, it's uh, waiting at the door for you. So here's a very interesting study done in uh, Finland. Uh, basically 29,000 individuals, half men, half women. They had them lower their cholesterol intake. So uh, what did they have them quit eating? Meats, milk, eggs, cheese. Okay, so they lowered their intake of that. Uh, they lowered their blood pressure. Maybe salt, exercise, different things. And they had them stop smoking. And they had a 55% decrease in death rate in men and a 68% decrease in death rate in women. So even heart disease, you can get the handle on it. Uh, it is like that. Here's a study done by 19 countries, and they looked at their mean cholesterol, so their average cholesterol, all right? And, um, and then deaths from heart disease. And you can see Canada and the United States are over here. Uh, they may have a little lower mean cholesterol, but they have a higher death rate than other countries. So France and Italy and some others might have a, a greater um, mean cholesterol, average cholesterol, but less heart disease. Why? Because we're going to look a little bit is the kind of cholesterol or the makeup of the total cholesterol. And uh, your risk, your mortality risk rises the higher your cholesterol goes. So if you're getting up to 260 or above, Again, I don't know what your readings are here, but the, you are in great danger. 183% greater risk of heart disease. Here is uh, some uh, <clears throat> cholesterol in milligrams in three ounces of food. As you can see, fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables, zero. Zero cholesterol. And um, the only animal product that has zero cholesterol is a white. So if you happen to go to a restaurant and order our heart-healthy omelets, you're going to get a, an omelet without the yolks uh, of the egg. So in the yolk is 213 milligrams of cholesterol. Now beef brains, we don't eat anymore because of mad cow disease. So, uh, but they are extremely high in cholesterol. But uh, you notice over here that uh, tuna, clams, crab, uh, oysters, sardines, shrimp, a lot of times people think that there's no cholesterol in fish, but that's not true. They might be better in the certain types of oil, uh, certain types of fat, uh, less saturated fat, but they've got just as much cholesterol. So where does cholesterol come from? <clears throat> cholesterol is an important physiological steroid or steroids classified as lipid or fat. And the name derived from two Greek words, which uh, um, which means solid bile. So since bile occurs only in animal secretions, cholesterol is found only in animal products. So, so where does bile come from? The liver. So your liver is where cholesterol comes from. Very important. And um, that's why that your liver will produce all the cholesterol you will ever need. So cholesterol forms the building of uh, manufacturing certain steroidal hormones, such as those from the adrenal cortex and the sex glands. So your, your estrogen and testosterone and so forth comes from cholesterol. Uh, progesterone, all that. Cholesterol uh, uh, is from everything it's made from. So again, your body uh, and the designer of your body knew that, and our liver produces cholesterol so efficiently. Um, any condition in the life of a person that increases the need for extra hormones, such as those from physical stress or illness or various emotional stresses, will increase the uh, production of cholesterol. So we earlier in our presentation, um, uh, uh, 
we found that uh, the condition of our intestinal tract in relation to emotion, uh, the function of the bacteria, can increase, um, uh, call for increase for more cholesterol. So I've had individuals come to me and say, uh, uh, an older lady would come and say, well, you know, after my husband died, my cholesterol went way up. Well, because now she had all the responsibility. She didn't know where all the, where all the bank accounts were or didn't know about all the bills and maybe we lived on a farm and had to sell the farm and all that stress came and when all that stress came, her cholesterol went up to be able to handle the stress. So, you want a good, healthy, strong body to handle any type of stress that the body doesn't have to hormonally try to stimulate us to um, uh, be able to handle it. Now, because cholesterol is so efficiently manufactured in the body, there's no daily requirement for it. Uh, on, on the label of your food, you will be a listing of minerals and vitamins uh, and their RDA, the recommended daily amount. Well, you will never see that for cholesterol because you do not have to eat it. It is not necessary. Your liver will produce all you need at any time, in any place, and not only that, it's the perfect combination. It's exactly what you need. So, HDL uh, is, is uh, considered the good cholesterol. Uh, HDL is, is, uh, is responsible for helping the blood vessels uh, stay cleaner of the what they call the bad cholesterol, the LDL. So the higher your HDL level, the less risk you have of having a heart attack. Okay? So HDL is really important um, uh, for you to know uh, and how to do it. So here is a study done with Boston Marathon runners. So you know, every year they have a marathon in Boston and a tennis thousand people go and run and they of these uh, individuals who were a group of physicians so they tested these physicians they agreed to test for the amount of hcl in comparison to their exercise so we saw that the more miles per week that they ran the higher their hcl so uh dr ophelia mentioned about uh keeping the health of the bacteria up with what one of them was exercise. Yeah. Yeah, you produce exercise is probably one of the prominent laws of health. Uh, so the higher or the more miles per week. Now you, it's it's aerobic type exercise. So exercise you're gonna get a lot of oxygen with, a lot of movement, a lot of oxygen. Now you don't have to run, you can walk. Now if you can walk briskly then it's more beneficial to you. So you would like to be able to uh, get your circulation going a little bit to where you might sweat a little bit. Make a moment shower, go to work. But you can raise you, you can raise your HDL and you need to raise your HDL. And the other point, the other area, is diet. So uh, uh, on, we used to take an average or uh, a ratio, and that is to take your, your total cholesterol and you divide it by your HDL, and that will give you a ratio. So that was an indicator of your risk for heart disease. So as you can see, that the total vegetarians, or the vegans, um, they have the lowest risk factor, the lowest ratio. Those Boston Marathon runners, uh, those physicians, was up to 3.4. So um, the thing with the Boston Marathon runners, it had they didn't, that it wasn't their diet or whether they used alcohol or their coffee or any of those things. It was just their exercise. And it did help, but in combination with diet, you can really get a handle on it. So in the United States, the average risk factor for uh, in the average woman is 4.4, average man is five, but the death starts very quickly. So you don't want to be average. You see with the woman, is 4.6. So from 4.4 to 4.6, only uh, two little decimals, uh, two little uh, minute uh, 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 
areas that uh, between health and death, between average and death. We don't ever want to shoot for average, we want to shoot for the best. This was mine done. Uh, I was going through a store and they were offering free cholesterol readings, so this was in 1997. Um, so I just stopped in. My total cholesterol was 127, my HDL was 44. So my ratio came out to 2.8888888. So they run it off to 2 There is a, a, a way of controlling your cholesterol. So here's some examples of fish oil and cholesterol. This is a three and a half ounce T-bone steak. It has 79 milligrams of cholesterol in it. Two teaspoons of uh, parrot oil has 115 milligrams of cholesterol. Uh, salmon oil has 73, two teaspoons. Sardine oil, 106. Cod liver oil, 86. So even though it's fish, it's still full of cholesterol. Okay, in this uh, clip, unfortunately we can't hear it, but uh, Dr. Elselton is talking about heart disease. He's talking about things that you should avoid, and it was you know, fish and animal products. And one of the lists was oil. Then he stands up and he says, no oil. And people laugh. He says, no oil. Most people don't hear me, but no oil. And um, I recently gave a little presentation in, uh, in Massachusetts. And when I said no oil, I got <gasps> Oil is a massive junk food. We want to avoid the junk food for what it does to our intestinal tract and our health, right? Oil, I want you to go home, I want you to pick up your bottle of oil, and I want you to read the nutritional ingredients. Now, we don't use sugar, which is about 45 calories per tablespoon. But we don't use white sugar, don't want to use white sugar, because it's empty calories. So it's fuel without any backing. So there's no minerals, there's no vitamins, there's no protein, there's no fiber, not a car no carbohydrates, it's nothing. It's, it's, um, it's uh, what it does is causes deficiency in the body because the body has to have that process it so it goes in and robs it from you. Well, oil is 120 calories per tablespoon, almost triple the amount of calories, and there is no fiber, there's no carbohydrate, there's no vitamin, there's no minerals, there's no protein, there's nothing. And he mentions olive oil. Olive oil is very high in omega-6. Unfortunately, the, the promotion now is, is we think olive oil is very healthy, but it's one of the worst things for you as far as inflammation in your bloodstream. Uh, it causes as much as a 30-some percent reduction in blood flow in the body six hours after a meal with olive oil as its main source of fat. Perfect circulation is perfect health. If you have anything that is reducing your circulation, it's reducing your health. So the Mediterranean diet, if I ask somebody, somebody tells me they're on the Mediterranean diet, and I say, well, what do you eat? The first thing they tell me is olive oil. But olive oil has as much, as, it's probably the least of their uh, the uses that they have. Okay? They use very little olive oil. Um, but uh, this, uh, the study was done in the late 50s and was done in the Isle of Crete. Um, and what happened in the Isle of Crete is Hitler again had taken the island. And he had stripped it of all of its animals. Um, so they had no animals, no animal products. So these folks had, uh, had to go to farming. Well, they, they farmed on the side of the mountains. They were walking seven to nine miles a day up and down the mountain to work in their gardens and gather their food and come back. They were on a plant-based diet with an enormous amount of exercise outside the fresh air and the sunshine. And they had the lowest mortality rate for heart disease and cancer and diabetes. 
but you could have gone uh, two countries over and you would have been in Italy, okay? And, uh, or, uh, and, and they used triple the amount of olive oil and had double the amount of, of cancer or heart death from heart disease and uh, diabetes. So it wasn't the olive oil, it was the exercise and the plant-based diet. So don't think you're on a Mediterranean diet if you're using olive oil. Reconsider. So they went back to the Isle of Crete and they did a little study in 2004. Had 254 patients, half with heart disease and half with owls. And uh, the ages were 33 to 77. And the patients with the heart disease had a significant higher intake of monounsaturated fatty acids, which is found primarily in olive oil. And the ones that had, did not have the heart disease had a higher intake of carbohydrates, fiber, folic acid, and omega-3. So, from the plants. So your prevention and your health is going to come from plants. By the way, all nutrition comes from plants. Protein comes from plants. Okay? Carbohydrates come from plants. Your vitamins, your minerals. This is source, this is source of nutrition is plants. And in nutrition, the closer you can get to the source of something, the more valuable it is to you. So, for instance, a tiger eats a vegetarian animal. A lion will eat a vegetarian animal. Now, it may kill a hyena or some other animal. It's not going to eat it. So they want to get as close to the source of protein and source of nutrition as they can. So they go after vegetarian animals. All life comes from plants. So here's Dr. Vogel did some studies in relation to this. Um, and uh, this study has shown that a meal containing olive oil as a fat source reduced brachial artery flow mediated vessel dilation or the the dilation of your blood vessels uh, by 31% for up to six hours after a meal, peaking at four hours. So if you already have a problem, let's say your arteries are already partially blocked to your heart, and you're using olive oil, which now restricts the blood vessels even more, what might happen? A small clot could, could send you to a heart attack, a stroke, or a kidney failure. So the benefits of Mediterranean diet seems to be the antioxidant-rich foods, uh, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and grains. Um, so even if you increase your intake of uh, the vegetables, so he's talking about the study in Isle of Crete, since they increased their uh, use of vegetables and fruits, even though they used a little bit of olive oil, it seemed to have uh, balanced out its effects. So here's a, a study done with 15 young, heart-healthy men. They had them uh, on what we call a low-fat diet and then uh, a, a higher-fat diet using oil or olive oil as a fat source. Um, in the White Creek Wellness Center, where I'm from, we, we use only a low-fat diet. We don't use any oils. So we use all of our fat sources from the whole product, so from the nuts and the seeds and so on and so forth. So they did a study here uh, uh, um, five hours after the meal with the young, heart-healthy men. They had a blood flow reduction by 26% because of the use of olive oil in their meal. Their triglycerides doubled. So triglycerides is the fat floating in the blood. And the ones with the low fat, their blood flow actually increased five hours after the meal. Why would that be? Well, they were eating more fruits and vegetables and some nuts and seeds, and these are our sources of omega-3. And omega-3 will allow your blood vessels to expand and you have a greater blood flow. 
So instead of restriction in blood flow, they had a greater blood flow. And their triglycerides went up a little bit. Okay. Dr. Walter Willett, who's a professor of epidemiology and nutrition at Harvard, was doing a study of heart disease in the United States. So uh, he was looking to try to find the source or when um, heart disease really sprang into uh, uh, the condition is today as an epidemic. And so he was able to find out something and um, says it was Willis who insisted that not all fats, but certain fats led to coronary heart disease. Saturated fats and red meat, butter, cheese were no danger. He linked trans fatty acids in margarine and shortening made from partly hydrogenated oils to an epidemic of heart disease began in 1930-1940. So trans fatty acids increased the LDL, the bad cholesterol, and uh, depressed the HDL, that good cholesterol. So uh, your HDL gathers that LDL out of your bloodstream and carries it down to your liver. And then in your liver processes it, sends it out, uh, out of the bile to be uh, sent out into uh, your high fiber diet that you eat with lots of fruits and vegetables and gotten rid of it. Well, if, if you're not in the right balance, you're going to get all stones, you're going to get your fatty liver, you're not going to be able to process it out, your cholesterol will start to rise, your bloodstream. So, um, what is trans fatty acids? Uh, what is hydrogenated oil? Hydrogenated oil is where you take uh, uh, liquid oil, such as uh, soybean oil, or corn oil, or olive oil, or any other type of liquid oil, and you artificially make it into a saturated fat, or a fat that will be solid at room temperature, i.e. you have margarine. Okay? So that's, a, that's with pressure and heat, you, you, you make hydrogen stick to the carbon molecules, and you man-make a hydrogenated oil. And in that process, it produces something called trans fatty acids. And um, they are very dangerous. In fact, in 2008, in the United States, it made all manufacturers list the amount of trans fatty acids on their label. But unfortunately, they they have, uh, they have a, a little way out, and it says so for a serving, one serving. So it doesn't tell you how much that serving is. So a manufacturer could just turn, change the serving size and get away with um, around the law. So here, women, this is done uh, with a study with 66,000 nurses, one of the largest nutrition studies. Um, Women who eat four or more teaspoons of margarine today have a 66% greater risk of heart disease than women who have margarine less than once a month. Here is that little way out for the manufacturers who sell products in the United States. Um, um, if it's serving, contains less than a half a gram of trans fats, the content when declared shall be expressed as zero. So is there zero trans fat? No, there's at least a half a gram. But let's say a company like Fritos or something, uh, let's say a serving size, which they, they determine what a serving size is, is a gram of, of trans fats. So instead of putting a big warning later on that says one, you know, trans contains one gram of trans fat, um, they can change the serving size to to half of what it was. They have a half a gram of trans fat. They put on the label zero trans fat. So your labeling is uh, is uh, subject to money. So here is a blood vessel. Inside the blood vessel is called an endothelium. And if uh, that endothelium is really how long you're going to live, its flexibility is really how long you live. So once it starts to get hard um, or interfered with, your lifespan is coming down. So you end up with arteriosclerosis, right? Hardening of the arteries. That's that endothelium. 
Well, when you're, when, if you were eating a lot of margarine and a lot of oil and it's the meat and cheese and those things, um, you're going to have a lot of cholesterol and saturated fat. Well, it's going to start to stick underneath that endothelium called the street. So it's, uh, it's not supposed to be there. And since it's sticky, it's so kind of like Velcro, it's going to start gathering whatever it can that flows by. So if more fat flows by, it starts to build up. Okay? And it builds to a point that it becomes what we call plaque. Now that plaque is cholesterol saturated fat, but it's normally not our cholesterol. So if we're eating milk, egg, cheese, and meat, that would be somebody else's cholesterol. And that usually is rancid, the rancid fat, acidic, so it starts to corrode that endothelium. Now, um, you also notice what's happening to the blood vessel? It's shrinking, it's getting small, but still the same volume of fluid is supposed to be going through there. So what's happening to your blood pressure? It's going up, right? Now, since it's starting to corrode that endothelium, the body says, well, wait a minute, that's dangerous. So it sends fibers down to build what's called a cap over that, that deteriorated area. But those fibers are not supposed to be in there. And our immune system will go down and attack the fibers that are in the bloodstream. So the blood pressure's up, blood flow's trying to go through, the immune system's breaking down those fibers, the, the plaque is still eating away at the material, and then, boom, the clot takes place. And then, unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to see this clip either, but uh, they go in, and uh, there's a heart attack, a man's taken to the hospital, and they, they um, a doctor that's assigned to him that night takes out his blood, and when he looks at the blood, uh, he notices that it's, it, the, what's on top of the blood is just, just, it sticks to the tube and it's just fat. And normally it's, it's a little yellow, but it's fairly clear. So he goes back to the man and he says, uh, did you eat before you came? He says, yeah. He says, I, I had a, a malt and a, and, a, and a hamburger or cheeseburger, I think you put it there. Mm -hmm. So that was all that fat from what he ate had oozed out into his blood, okay? So it's sticking to the tube, so that's what it does to the bloodstream, it sticks in there to the bloodstream and collects and collects and collects. Then they take the man to the hospital, and unfortunately you can't see this, but it, we're, we were gonna look at open heart surgery. And then we're gonna open up the man's chest, and look at his heart, open the vessel up, and pull this stuff out, like plastic, out of his bloodstream, which was all that plaque. And that is a heart attack. So, it's not quite as effective when I say it, when we see it. What can we do to reduce the cholesterol? Well, it's interesting. They had a uh, study, again, a very healthy young man, okay? And uh, they took this group of, of young men and they reduced the amount of fat that they were eating um, and replaced it, equaled it, with walnuts, the fat from walnuts. And um, they found that one cup, one half cup of walnuts uh, a day for four weeks lowered their bad cholesterol by 18 points. And walnuts, is a, uh, English walnuts, is a very good ratio, um, fatty ratio. So um, when you get into omega-6 and omega-3, you have to have a, a good ratio to be able to have the good omega-3. If you have too much omega-6, then you can't get the omega-3. It's ineffectual. But walnuts is that a good ratio, good range. Um, they had people, uh, that, uh, 850 people categorized for the amount of oatmeal they ate, okay? So one day, um, uh, bowl eaters uh, uh, lowered their blood pressure and lowered their cholesterol. So what is it about um, oatmeal? 
Well, there are there basically uh, there are many kinds of fiber, but basically there's two types, and that is soluble and insoluble. Insoluble um, is they don't, it's not dissolved in water. Basically, it goes through in, in our intestinal tract and, and helps with the flora and cleans our intestinal tract. Soluble fiber goes is able to go up and is used to help clean the bloodstream. So um, oatmeal is high in soluble fiber. So this is just looking at some sources of fiber, soluble and insoluble. Um, and of course, fiber only comes from plants, by the way. You can only get it from plants. You can have a 2,000-pound um, a uh, sear bowl and you have no fiber. You can get any fiber. You have more fiber in a banana than that whole bowl. Okay, so fiber comes from plants. So here are some sources of fiber. Uh, some things you might not be familiar with, carrot flour, that uh, basically comes from the East, Middle East. Um, but it is an excellent um, natural chocolate. Okay? Without it, without the theobromine and other things that are in it that are harmful than chocolate. So the strongest animals, when you think about the strongest animals, they are vegetarian. So elephants. Wow, we got sound. Alright. So they're 10 feet at the shoulders, 4 to 6 tons, and what do they eat? Grass, holy fruit. Iron triathlon, only one man in the green, the iron triathlon, uh, triathlon more than twice, he's got six times winners. Vegetarian. Okay. Um, endurance. You think of endurance. A horse, of course. 24 hour triathlon. Swam 4.8 miles, cycled 185 miles, and ran 52.5 miles in 24 hours. Six year old Ernest, food choice, complete vegetarian. How about spring? Rhinoceros. Bill Pearl. Four times winner. Mr. Universe, bodybuilding. Roy Hilligan, winner, Mr. American, bodybuilding. Andrew Spalding, winner, Mr. International, bodybuilding. Dan Price, world record bench press. Good choice, all vegetarians. The end.